Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you might be. Welcome to this month's Intentional Success webinar. Don't wait to see how this year will turn out. And we're gonna talk about the keys to taking control of your business outcomes before they control you. Now it's very timely while you know we are kind of almost all the way through January. It's really the beginning of the year for most of us um, with the long holiday season and uh, probably that first week, the second week of January, we're just about a total waste for, for a lot of us getting out of that weird holiday timing that we had this year. Uh, it's all pretty big on our minds. And you've, you've got a plan for this year, you've set a budget, you've got some forecasts, you've got some high hopes, and we're gonna talk about those things because that, none of those are a guarantee, are they, right? And there's a little bit of insecurity running around your building right now about how well this is all gonna work out for you. So let's talk about that today and what we can start to do about that. Um, I am your, uh, as always, your presenter, Tom Stimson. Um, one of these days I'll update the slide, but you know, that's a great picture. I really looked like that one day. Uh, here's all my vitals. Uh, find us, uh, Stimson Group on Facebook. Find me on Facebook, LinkedIn. Uh, we post a lot of articles on LinkedIn. Uh, get a lot of dialogue going there. We have the AV Matters Facebook group as well. Uh, get involved in that. Be able to have, you know, talk to your peers, get some questions out there. Activity is growing on that page every month, and it's really, really fun to watch. So get involved with all that. Get out of your, get out of your shells. Talk to some other folks. Now, why, why this particular webinar? Here at the beginning of the year, I should be brimming with optimism and all the excitement of the thing, but here's the deal. Despite your best plans, you know, 2020 is gonna happen. <laughs> 2020 has other plans and we don't know what they are. We're still trying to figure out what 2019 had in store for us while we close out our books. So things are gonna happen and expecting the unexpected isn't a call to not plan. And I've talked to a number of folks in my career that said, you know, we don't bother doing planning because we're just gonna react and we're really good at reacting. And it's like, well, yeah, man, that's why you're still a $1 million company after being in business for 30 years. So I'm not saying that's a horrible thing, but gosh, what could you have done with a little bit of planning, pushing some ideas forward? And annual results start on day one. So we're three weeks into the year, and you've already uh, significantly affected whether or not you're gonna have your December 31st outcome as planned. It's already happened. It's a zero-sum game. It starts from day one. So if you're going to have a successful 2020, maybe your planning needs to start three or six months earlier, and you'll understand why as we get through this webinar and why that might be important. You know, always having a rolling 12-month plan might be a great idea for some of us to have. So that's why we're going to have this webinar. So... Every business, every business owner certainly has a dream plan. This is the year we're gonna grow revenue, our cash flow is gonna keep up with demand, our profit targets are gonna be met, we're gonna get new ideas are implemented, and all the windfall revenue is gonna fall perfectly in between projects, and I'm gonna finally get that boat that's two feet bigger. Anybody who's a boat owner knows that your goal, the boat you have is great, but the boat you want is two feet longer. How am I gonna get that two foot longer boat? This is the year that's going to do it. It's finally going to be our year. Yeah. Um, so what happens is, well, hey, guys, we're going to grow this year. So we have a bigger CapEx budget. And here it is. It's, you know, third week of January. And your operations managers are going, well, where's all my CapEx? And you're thinking, well, we haven't grown yet. But I can't grow without my CapEx. No, no, no. You don't get your CapEx until we grow. And then the rest of the year just kind of devolves into that that battle over goals and what we need to achieve them. And it ends up looking a little bit like this, the best laid plans of the year. So what if the things you started in plan A aren't part of plan C? You know, January one, you have plan A, and then you get some new information and you go to plan B and you get some new information and you go to plan C. And now it's, it's the middle of the year and you finally have your plan C in place. But some of your team started working on the things that were part of plan A and they're already in motion. And maybe they don't fit anymore. Maybe they're too soon. Maybe they're too late. Uh, maybe they're redundant to something else that we're doing in one of the other plans. So how do we get through this? How do we understand how this works? So let's take a plan. Let's take a sample plan. Oop. Let's take another sample plan. 
so here's a sample plan. All right, I'm gonna grow revenue by 10% and I'm gonna improve gross profit by five points. Uh, for those of you who don't understand the terminology, 10, growing revenue by 10% means if I did a million dollars last year, I wanna do $1.1 million this year. Growing gross profit by five points means if I had 30% gross profit last year, I wanna have 35% gross profit this year. So there's a difference in how those two things are measured. So if I wanna improve, improve my gross profit margin, and grow 10%, I've got to do some things. And we've determined in this 2020 plan that we're going to have to institute that. Remember that CRM that you paid for last year and you never used? Well, you better start using it because you need better forecasting because we're going to have some demand issues. We want to make sure we're on track. And yeah, we want to hire a new sales rep because there's, there's extra sales there that we don't know who's going to handle them because everybody's, well, too busy, right? We're going to increase our line of credit because when we're busy, we're a little tight on cash, and we, that would be one thing that we don't have to worry about. And yeah, we're maxed out on warehouse space, but we got two years left on our lease. And if we're going to grow 10% this year, we're going to have to get some extra warehouse space to use, to maybe for dead storage or long-term storage. Oh yeah, we need to raise our pricing. That would be really important to help us get that revenue growth. And to improve, improve our gross profit, we're going to have to buy better. So we're going to have to be better at negotiating purchases. So all of these initiatives, these six initiatives are all very important in getting this 2020 plan going. Now, does that mean that at the end of January, January is automatically 10% bigger than it was last year? And of course the answer is no. We know that's not how it works because we have a kind of a, we have a little problem here is that we don't know which thing comes first. Does the goal come first or do the things that it takes to achieve the goal come first? We have a chicken and the egg problem. And I run into this in my clients all the time um, until we can get them sorted out on how to do this better. And it usually manifests in something like, well, I said, hey, we're gonna add two CAD licenses this year. Well, that's great, can we have those now? Well, we only have one person who knows how to use CAD, so what do we need the other two for yet? Well, I can't hire them until I have the CAD stations. <sighs> okay, <laughs> so we're, we've got this yin, we've got this push and pull thing going on, um, which comes first. So we've got to figure this out. We've got to figure out how to make these two things work together. And I'm gonna take you through the steps that we use to do that. And then I'm gonna show you what the revised 2020 plan is. And by the way, it's the exact same plan that we're looking at now, except it's actually gonna happen. And I want you to see how different those two plans are. So this is what most of us do. Here are our initiatives for this, for this year. Here are the things we're gonna get done. Rah, 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 let's go get them. You know, everybody stick your hand in the middle. Yay, let's go. Now, we get to starting at work and all of a sudden we start noting that, oh, that didn't go well, or this hasn't happened yet, or ooh, that was a really bad month. Or, oh my goodness, did you see March? March is gonna be horrible. We're gonna be so busy, we didn't plan on that. When do you start checking results on what you're doing and decide whether or not you need to make a change in what your plan is? I mean, do you wait till the end of the year and you look backwards? Well, no, I mean, logically, no, we know better than that. But what mechanisms do you have to figure out what you're doing? To figure out how you um, determine whether or not you're on the right path and you need to make a correction. So we don't want to overcommit, especially if the goal is an sure thing. I mean, I hate to hire a, a, a new salesperson and not have my CRM in place. And oh, by the way, not have my new pricing in place. Uh, that just means that I'm going to have a lot more work to do to get all those other things done. And maybe if you thought about these things, you might actually be able to move faster. Maybe, maybe having better forecasts than you expected cause you to accelerate some things. And how would we know that? What, what, what's the trigger that tells us that that's the thing to do? So what we're gonna talk about today is we're gonna talk about connecting the end to the beginning. I like this movie poster I just happened to find. I was, like, I was trying to find, what's a picture I could put on here? This movie poster is hilarious. How do we connect the end to the beginning? Now, this is interesting because I'm talking to a, a, an audience full of people who do projects for a living. Every one of you does projects for a living. That's what your business is. It's all project-based. Very few of you are actually in the transaction business. You've got projects with timelines. And so this would seem obvious to you that 
projects start with the with the the finish date and then you kind of work backwards well managing a business works the same way as well but somehow we forget that in the heat of doing things because projects will always take precedence you know doing something for a customer is more important than you know oh uh, finishing up that uh, uh, that that how to uh, manual for you know uh, changing your email signature i mean that's that seems really unimportant when the client needs a drawing finished. So we sometimes neglect our business and we forget about what the finish is and then back timing all the things that have to happen to get it done and giving us the room for all the other things that are going to pull on that schedule and know that every time we miss an interim deadline, we're actually pushing the final deadline away. So if my goal is to grow 10% this year, and I haven't done the six things that I need to do in order to allow that 10% growth, until those six things are done, I, I don't have a year to count forward. The 10% growth will start on the day or the week or the month that I finished all those things that are in front of it. And then the year after that is where I should see 10% growth by design. By definition, that's the way it would work. So how do we run our business that way? and change the way that we think. So timeline-based management is an important part of all this. If you look at very large successful organizations and even small successful organizations, you'll see um, very methodical business plans, budgets, timelines, <laughs> strategies to get things done. And you will see the budget change when the timeline is affected. Now, there are some steps that there are some things that we need to do, some disciplines that we need to have as management to adopt this, this timeline-based approach to running a business. And I'm gonna go through several of those briefly here, but the first thing I want is, is to connect the sales funnel to budget. So if I cast a budget, and very often, um, you know, budgeting is an afterthought, a fiscal budget is an afterthought, uh, we're going to do better than last year is not a budget. And your poorer accountant, bookkeeper, controller being tasked with come up with a budget, all they can really do is take what you did last year, hit the create a budget button in QuickBooks, and it generates a budget. And then they can adjust things, but what do they adjust? Well, what's the revenue going to be? Well, we're going to grow 10% next year. So do they go automatically increase every month by 10%? Are we just going to do a really huge December? What is it? Because all of those things will differently affect how your budget comes out, how your cash flow is affected, all those kinds of things. So in order to properly forecast and budget, I've got to connect the sales funnel to it. And if our sales funnel says, okay, well, January is going to be about the same as last year or a little bit less. And, oh, it looks like we're going to have a good February, but we can't see March very well yet. And oh, by the way, we have no idea what the second half of the year is going to go. I can't do an accurate forecast, and I don't have enough information to take on the risk it takes to grow the business. So we've got to get really good, crystal clear, if not laser focused, and if not super accurate, on forecasting. So our sales funnel needs to connect to budget. And as our sales funnel changes, from week to week, month to month, that's also got to change the budget. And the budget tells me whether or not I have money to do the initiatives that are contingent on other things happening, like, well, uh, increasing gross profit. And it also tells me whether or not I can afford to invest in the things that will help me grow or help me improve gross profit, because those are actually investments. Do I have the money to do that? What's the timing of the outcomes of that? What's the timing of the spend uh, versus the result? And it all starts with the sales funnel. So when am I gonna have business? How much business am I gonna have? And how accurate am I typically on these forecasts? And the more you do it, the more accurate you're going to get, and you're gonna be probably wildly inaccurate at first, but you have to do it. Take your sales funnel, connect it to your budget, reduce some of the guessing, it will probably scare the heck out of some of you because you don't know where your revenue is coming from, but isn't that good information to have? Um, by the way, if you need help with forecasting, give me a call. I've done 
more of it than probably anybody in the business. Um, give me a call. I'll tell you a little, I'll give you some clues about how to do it, how I can help you do that. Now, the next thing we have to do is we have to take that budget, which is now better and richer because of our understanding of the sales funnel and our, and we need to connect it to cash flow. So having a great year can sometimes be the thing that wrecks a company. You run out of cash. Uh, you can't keep up with your bills. <laughs> you go to collections. You know, a lot of bankruptcies are really from companies being wildly successful, but not being able to keep up with the cash flow of success. So cash flow is king. You've heard every business owner say cash is king. It's the most important thing we do. I spend all my time managing cash flow. Let's get better at managing cash flow. Our budget tells us what our cash flow needs to be which means our budget better be pretty accurate. We better be pretty good at budgeting. This way we can be good at forecasting cash flow needs. So these things, again, are connected. Don't worry, I'll get to the thing where I get to spend the CapEx, right? I also have to be really good at connecting, connecting demand to resources. So I'm an old operations guy at heart. I look at demand. I look at capacity. I look at utilization. These are things that are innately important to me. And I need to connect demand to resources. And I may see a period, for instance, you know, we're going to have a busy May. May is a busy month for a lot of you. Great. Well, when in May? Well, looks like these two weeks are going to be real busy. So what do we need to do? Well, we need to bring in five extra guys in the warehouse. We'll keep them busy for 14 days. I said, 14 days, right? Well, yeah, I'll give or take. Okay. The better you can get at understanding the demand the tighter you can get that window of, of when you think you have excess demand to your supply, the more accurate you can be with that, the less money you will spend, the more money you will make, the more efficient your business will be. All right, so if we connect demand to resources, and we always look at that in terms of when do I need peak capacity, and then I'm trying to constantly tighten that window of overhires or excess demand or renting extra trucks or whatever it might be, um, you know, lifting overtime caps, all the things that you do when you're super busy, if I can make that a smaller and smaller window, I'm going to inherently be more efficient and which all leads to me getting to my overall goals. So connecting demand to resources has got to be an institutional mindset. And then I also have to, as a management team and owner, look at my business every quarter maybe more often, but at least at every quarter, and say, am I really doing the things that we said we would do that's gonna yield my 10% growth and my five basis points on gross profit improvement? So let's break the company up into sales, operations, and finance, and let's find three things in each area that we know will be good leading indicators that we're going to achieve our goal. They don't have to be direct in indicators. They can be combined indicators, as you'll see in this example. So uh, I just went through this last week with a client and just looking at some of the things on their list, you know, to help, you know, they have some huge sales goals, but they know they can achieve them and do the other things that we just talked about, about, you know, uh, connecting the, you know, the budget to cash flow and the sales funnel to budget and, and demand to supply without, uh, CRM compliance. They have got to use the CRM. They have to use it accurately. We have to get good reports out of it. We need to be able to see potential demand in the future. Um, it's very important to have that transparency. We can't be surprised by too much revenue or too little revenue. We need to see it coming. Then we can work on it. Then we can adjust. Um, this company, as most of you do, need to update your pricing. <laughs> your costs have changed. Why haven't your prices changed? So, um, we, this particular, I mean, needs to get new pricing implemented. That's going to be very, very important for achieving their goals. And they have to sell to a gross profit target. They have to achieve a certain amount of dollars of gross profit in order for the sales team to deliver the outcomes that they're responsible for. It's not revenue. Revenue is great. Revenue is a predictor of gross profit. At the end of the day, you don't, you shouldn't care as much about revenue as you do gross profit. Gross profit was what goes to the bottom line. Okay? Revenue is just a trigger. So if you, if you chase revenue, you will get revenue. Chase gross profit, gross profit's way more valuable. Uh, the operations group, 
you know, uh, these guys want a new warehouse. Um, they feel crowded and overworked. You know what? I, you don't get a new warehouse until you've shown me that you can utilize the floor space that you have now. Are you taking the steps? Are you doing the things to extend this floor space and make it maximized? Are you, have you figured out how to do everything on time? Are you keeping your overtime to budget? In other words, are you managing well enough that I'm willing to invest in new resources for you? Because what I don't want to do is give you more resources so that you can be less disciplined about the resources that you have. I will give you more resources if I can see that the discipline is there to use it wisely and effectively. So it's not that we're being jerks when we hold back resources. It's usually an indication is that we're not seeing the resources we have being used well. So as operations, we're always focused on improving efficiency, getting better at timing, getting better at um, uh, supporting our internal and external customers. All of these things matter. And an operation that's good at all that stuff will tend to get more of the resources because it'll be money well spent. Uh, finance. Um, cash flow is important, so how about some cash flow forecast accuracy? You know, no surprise demands on money would be a really good assessment. Um, that line of credit usage, you want more line of credit? Show me you're using the line of credit wisely. Okay, we're using it just in time, we're paying it back as quickly as possible, we're minimizing the interest expense that's related to that. Um, if we want to improve cash flow, how about collecting the bills? So day sales outstanding is an important metric. So I shouldn't, I'm not going to go to the bank and ask for a bigger line of credit when you're not even collecting the receivables that we have now. Okay. So if management wants to go ahead and pull the trigger on the things that are in the plan for the year, where are the milestones or triggers that will tell me that it's okay to do that? And here's an example. So I've made that assessment maybe based on my first quarter of assessment that of all these things that are happening, I'm willing to go ahead and let some of these initiatives happen and some of these investments take place. So in that quarterly assessment, those items are connected to triggers. So like a warehouse space utilization is tied to added warehouse space. If I'm good at doing something and I prove that I can make additional warehouse space an asset, then I might be willing to take the rest, make that investment, make that commitment for doing that. So if we're doing all of these things, we should be able to get that growth and improved gross profit that we were talking about for the year. However, the timing of it is not gonna be from day one. January is not automatically gonna be 10% bigger and more profitable. It's going to accumulate, it's going to, some of these things are gonna start later. So let's revise the 2020 plan. I showed you the beginning plan. It was very simple. Here are the six things that we need to do. Here's what a revised plan looks like that takes into consider, consideration the timeline-based timeline management that I'm talking about. So the plan is on the left. Implement the CRM. Our goal is to be 50% completely trained in 90 days. So I'm not even gonna be 50% implemented in 90 days, but at least I'll be 50% implemented, right? So I need to do that. I need to add a sales rep. It takes 30 days to hire, it takes 90 days to onboard. That's 120 days before I have a person who's actually writing a profitable order. Let's be realistic, that's what it takes. We gotta get them on board or they have to find new customers or I need to give them some business. Right? It's gonna be a while before they're actually contributing to growth or the people whose accounts are taking over or are out contributing to growth, All right? 120 days, uh, increase the line of credit. If I decide to do that today, it's probably gonna take me 45 days to close. Your bank may be faster. Um, raise your pricing. How many of you have not done that because you think the project is huge? It is a big project, but it's mission critical. So let's call it a 60 day project. It will take six months to filter fully into your pipeline because the jobs you've already quoted are at the old pricing, you can't change them. So you won't get the benefits of raising your pricing until six months after you've done it. So, oh my goodness, get started. <laughs> We're eight months into the year before your every job is working off the new pricing. See, I told you you'd wanna start six months ago. 
that temporary monitor warehouse space. If I want to do that, you know, it's going to take me 60 days from the moment I decide to do it to secure the space and be able to move into it. I mean, realistically, we're in an up economy. Uh, warehouse space, office space has had a premium in every marketplace. Every one of my clients is, except for one, is looking for new space. Um, and all of their markets, that space is harder and harder to come by right now. So um, we need to monitor the demand, review it 80 days, and know that we're not going to fix this overnight. I can't wave a magic wand and suddenly give you 30% more floor space. Okay. However, <laughs> I can teach you how to use the floor space you have a heck of a lot better. And believe me, I walk through a lot of warehouses. Most of them could, have, could be improved significantly with some changes. Uh, negotiating better pricing. All right, I might need a few months to review and negotiate and implement. I may need to go to each one of my suppliers and renegotiate 10, 15, 20, 50, 100 items or a general agreement on pricing based off of a price sheet. Um, I can get that going much more quickly than I can get the results out of my uh, sell price changes. So if I can start buying better, and some things you can start buying better tomorrow, just ask every, every vendor, take, the, take their quote that they send you and just ask for 5% more. I mean, just try it. Just make that normal. You'd be amazed at how many people won't bat an eye and give you another 5%. Even if they say, this is the lowest price we can possibly go, just ask them for 5% more. What's the worst that can happen? Right? You can improve your buying significantly with just a little bit of effort. Review the results. So if it takes you 90 days to be fully implemented, you do a 90-day review, do a benchmark, review it again in another 60 days, make sure you're actually on that on the right track. Now, notice how far into the year we are with a lot of these things. Um, and then, what's the end game? Well, in this, I'm, as an example, I'm gonna say there's a profit share. Um, profit sharing is probably the best way, and there's a number of ways to profit share, so don't, don't overanalyze what that actually means. You know, it's a 401k matching contribution, it's an end of the year bonus. You know, there's a lot of things you can do where that are for your employees that are contingent on the profitability of the business. So if you want to improve their, improve their profit share, we're going to be able to measure the results between where you have been and where you are now and make that, make that impact. We would be lying to our employees on January 1 where we say, hey, we're going to grow 10% this year and increase gross profit by five basis points. That means that we're going to be able to do this for your profit sharing. Well, as you're seeing, there's, if, if our growth is contingent on the things you know, that we're trying to do here, um, it's unrealistic that we're going to yield all of that from the beginning of the year. So we're actually pushing it through the end of the year. So looking over on the right side, you'll see that this is all a series of triggers. You know, if sales can increase demand in 120 days by adding a sales rep, okay, and if new pricing is implemented in 180 days, and they're turning away sales due to capacity, three things, then I probably have impetus to, hire, to secure additional warehouse space. But I need these things to happen to make sure that I'm getting warehouse space that I can actually pay for. Things like the line of credit, increase it regardless. Always ask for a bigger line of credit. Most of you need a much larger line of credit than you have, but be really careful about its use. Limit that use. Make sure you're using it for cash flow, and not for buying things. Okay, it's not it's not a it's not a, a bottomless credit card that you can go out on a spending spree with. It's to pay payables when your receivables are a little bit behind. Sometimes we have a lot of people to pay before the client pays us. That's what line of credit is for. Nothing else. So we do all of these things, and in six months, if I've seen the growth in revenue and gross profit. Um, I've seen all these things happen above the triggers, then I can start to expect that I'm going to have revenue growth and increased gross profit in the last half of the year. So maybe my adjusted plan is we're going to grow 5% and maybe two or three basis points of gross profit improvement because it's all going to come in the second half of the year. 
And then my profit share calculation would be based on the increased change, but it's not going to be as big as this, oh, grow 10% or 20%. It's going to be more realistic based on most of the growth is going to come later on in the year. All right. This is, this is what we need to do. This is how we need to have these conversations inside of our organization. People need to see how all of these things are connected so that we don't create unreasonable expectations and demands on the system that we can't support later on. Start with the end goal, start working backwards. What has to be done? So if growing 10% this year meant your pricing was in place, the new salesperson was on board, everybody was up and trained on CRM January 1, then we should have started that initiative back in July so that we would hit the full year running. But you know what? 12 months from now is a full year. Next month when we're having this webinar, 12 months from then is another full year. A year is an arbitrary amount of time, but 12 months is a revolution around the sun. So we know what that is. It doesn't matter when you start measuring it from. The reason we always talk about 12 months in your business or talk about trailing 12 months in financials is I want to look at an entire year so I see all the seasons of your business. I see all of the busy months and the slow months every time I'm looking at your business, right? Some of you have a great first half of the year and a horrible second half of the year. Some of you have a great quarter two and three, but one and four are, are, are soft. But your year is always the 12 months from whenever you start measuring. Now, we do all this and you do that quarterly review and you go, you know what? This isn't working. Adding salespeople is not increasing my sales. Okay. Um, increasing our pricing is simply getting the customers to change what they're spending on. They're just not spending any more money. You know, yeah, we've got a little bit of an improvement in gross profit. And wow, our buying power is not what we thought it was. So all of a sudden, maybe this whole idea uh, isn't going to work. So how do you retreat? Well, if we change the goal and work backwards, <laughs> we'll come to that answer. Now, the fact of the matter is you don't have to grow revenue to improve your gross profit and make more money. That extra two feet of boat doesn't have to come from more sales. It could come from less sales. Less sales at higher prices and higher margins with better buying, without taxing demand, without getting above the supply demand curve of your operation would make you more profitable. Many of you would be more profitable being smaller for a little bit until you get your ducks in a row and can start moving forward again. Maybe having that less demand, I don't need the extra warehouse so we don't have that expense. I don't need that extra sales rep if I've got less demand. And if I improve my buying, that just pays off forever. So maybe that's a good plan for you for this year. So if you make the commitment to move forward and find out after the one quarter, you're not cut out for this, go the other way, change the outcome, change the date and make it happen. So there's no, you know what, there's really in this, in any small business, there is no shame in making money. You know, if revenue is how you define your business or, you know, you, you meet your, your, your other owners at the bar and brag about your business and you guys are all talking about top line, um, trust me, that, that's not good business. Talk about, how, talk about how big your boat is. That's has, that tells me more about how successful your business is than anything. So if your business is healthy and you've got a nice boat, or a cabin or whatever it is that makes you glad to be self-employed and have your own business. Okay, that's more valuable than all the fibs we tell about our business in terms of revenue and things like that. So how do we get there? Look forward, time backwards, start doing the things, be realistic about the outcomes. Um, and if you still want to grow 10% this year, then the second half of your year, means that you've got to do 20% better because it's going to take you a half a year to get to the point where you can start doing that growth consistently. And what does that look like?
There's the questions for you guys after the webinar. So um, I'll, I'll give you the heads up. Uh, I, I'd love to answer some questions about this. I know this is a difficult topic um, and you're probably struggling with some what if questions. Remember, I don't say who asked the question. So ask the question. Um, let's get your answer going um, and help you put some of these things to work. So I'll have some more thoughts coming up in a few minutes. Get your questions together and we'll chat about them. Um, next month's webinar, I'm going to continue on this theme about managing your business on an annualized basis instead of crisis to success to crisis. You know, let's run our business for the whole year instead of just in the moment. So next month, we're going to talk about why not all projects are created equal and why overmanaging margins is hurting your gross profit. Uh, companies that sell to a specific gross profit percentage, you have to get 30 points on this job or we can't sell it fundamentally do not understand what margin is. And I, I know I'm rubbing against the grain of, oh, probably 80% of my industry, uh, the industry that we're all in. However, <laughs> hear me out. Um, I've been wrong about a few things, but I'm not wrong about this. Join me next month. Help, uh, let me help you make more money. That's what it will be all about. Uh, speaking of making more money, Jumpstart Workshops in 2020, if you haven't put the dates on your calendar, our uh, first workshop will be in May, talking about strategy and marketing, um, owner, senior management, um, person in charge of your marketing, head of sales, great event for you to come to. Let's make sure our strategy and our marketing are, are working hand in hand. These are critical things. Marketing is not optional anymore, folks. It's not advertising. Okay. Marketing is probably responsible for most of your profit. So let's make sure that we're doing some things that will help that profit along. In August, we're going to do two workshops. Why? Well, the people who come to the sales workshop aren't typically the people who come to the operations workshop, but you're welcome to come to both. Uh, these will be well attended. I have not done sales for a couple of years. I'm very excited to get the sales folks back into the room, show them some love, help them become better at their profession. Um, how to put better proposals, better language, how to close better, how to better assess opportunities and get after that target customer. And this will be even more effective for the salespeople if your management and ownership went to strategy and marketing and can give you some better guidance account about the kind of business you're trying to achieve. Operations, always the best attended workshop. We had 120 folks last year. Um, wow, that was a, it was like too many people. So this year, we're gonna try and limit um, the sales and operations to about 80 folks. I want a room where everybody can be heard and talk and collaborate and do exercises together and not feel crowded or lost. I want to be able to talk to more people. 80 seems to be about the sweet spot. So as soon as registration starts, reserve your seats because um, I expect based on history, um, operations has had over 100 people the past two years. Um, we're going to sell out <laughs> pretty early in the process. Um, last time I did sales, I sold out in three weeks. Um, fastest selling workshop I ever did. A lot of pent up demand for sales. So please uh, plan for that. Uh, management will be in November once again. Uh, check the dates. We're not overlapping other industry events, so that should be a good time. And it saves, leaves your December for, you know, things you need to do with your your, your company and your families. So there's the workshops. Um, watch your <laughs> watch your inbox. We'll be announcing uh, the opening of the sale. Intro conversations um, very important um, for all of us. Um, as a matter of fact, I had, I mean, I had one this morning. I know the folks are on the call here, so I'm not going to, I'm not going to ratch out, but uh, introductory phone calls are, are great. Um, I love these things. I can share information. You know, we're not always the right fit. There's not always something that you need to hire me to do. Um, but I will make sure that the call was worth your while and that you get something that will help you in your business and help you better. I'm very, I'm very, I mean, I'm doing these webinars for free. I'm very generous with information. But if you think that I might be able to help your business or you have a problem that I can help you with, uh, why wouldn't you, you know, take a half an hour out and let's chat about it? Um, uh, what, I know I'll enjoy it. I'll guarantee you'll get something valuable out of it. So go to my website, schedule that call now. I look forward to talking to you. And all right. Um, 
All right, I got a couple of questions here, but we're not teeming with questions. So I'll remind you a couple of things about how to manage your business based on outcomes, based on these goals. It's very important in all of this to share your plans. And when you make a modification to your plan, as you're obviously gonna have to do in this system, when we get new information and new measurement, it's gonna change the plan, okay? Constantly be resharing this and talking about why we're doing this, how it's gonna affect the outcome, what the, you know, has the goal changed, has the goal been modified, and what it all means to people so that they can help um, measure, assess, adjust. It's not just a quarterly assessment. You know, there's things that you have to measure every month, every week. Make those adjustments on a regular basis. Make that normal. Shiny objects. If you choose to pursue a shiny object that wasn't in the plan, and you will, you have to redo the plan. Make the modifications, put the shiny object in there, reshare the plan, determine how you're going to make measurements, assessments, and adjustments, what the trigger points are, does it affect the outcome timing or the outcome amount, okay, revise it, work it into the plan. Otherwise, it's just a shiny object, it's a distraction, and people don't know how to support it. Uh, shiny objects are the bane of small business. Um, learn how to deal with shiny objects. It's not that I want you to quit having great ideas. It's just, what do you do with them? How do we make them powerful and effective? And more importantly, how do we shut them down when we don't need them? Um, one way to shut things down is budgeting. A plan without a budget is just a wish. So unfunded goals, <clears throat> shiny objects, should just be removed from the plan. If you can't fund it, you can't do it. Know when you're going to need money. Know how much you will need. You're going to need money. That's all part of the plan. It's all part of the budget. And then go fast or go slow. It's a choice. There's no right or wrong answer here. But waiting is a disaster for plans. Work towards the triggers. Work forward on the things that are going to allow things to happen. The wait and see approach is not a plan. Wait and see is just another type of reacting proactively do the things that will cause the triggers to lead to the next thing. That's how you get business done. As a friend of mine, <laughs> who's a, a, an avid amateur race car driver says, don't race more track than you can steer. Don't go faster than you know how to drive, right? Be realistic, work backwards from your goal, keep, the, <laughs> keep all four tires on the ground and you'll be fine. So, all right, let me look for a couple of questions here that look like they'll be fun answering. Um, well, I mean, fun for me anyway. Um, so I've got a question here about connecting. Uh, this probably relates to connecting demand to resources. Um, we have three months out of the year that we're really, really busy. And we have a lot of work to do, and we don't have enough people to do it. And, you're, and you've told us before to outsource, but we don't have any people to outsource. Okay, um, let me let me rephrase it because this this comes up quite often. There's some marketplaces where the freelance pool or the temporary labor pool, the overhire pool, is not ideal. Um, it makes it difficult to manage resources, so we tend to overstaff in those cities, which means that we have a lot of people not being very efficient when we're slow, and uh, but when we're busy, we're we're slammed, right? Um, I'll, I'll give you the answer that I've always given, and I've yet to be proven wrong. In any marketplace, you can develop the workforce you need. Yes, there is a risk that some of your competitors are gonna tap into that workforce, but it doesn't change the fact that you need to do it. Learn how to develop workforces. Learn how to use people who don't have, who are not highly trained to do things that they can do, but also have a program for training people. Is it expensive? Yeah, it can be. It is a cost of doing business. Um, by not doing it, you're, you're losing gross profit. You're losing money on efficiency, you're losing money on mistakes, and you're losing money on capacity. It's an important investment you need to make. And I've never had a client who invested in training the workforce around them tell me it was a bad idea, right? So look at your plan. If your goal is to grow 10%, 
increase your utilization, be more efficient in the warehouse, and workforce is your issue, then one of your initiative has to be is develop a training program where I could train 10 individuals and have at least two or three keepers, right? And set a reasonable return and get after it. Uh, okay, next one. Um, Hi, Tom. With 2019 being a down year with a lost client, we're considering a few big changes to regenerate revenue. One is the overhaul of our website, social media outlets. There was some neglect on our part in regarding on marketing and trying to overhaul that now. Good. Uh, the second is to consider hiring a sales rep to try and generate revenue through the usual means. But third, we've also discussed transitioning to gearless production model and trying to achieve success through partnerships and relationships. Have you had any experience with companies making that transition? All right. Yeah, a, a tremendous amount of experience. So uh, I think the question that you're really asking is, is the, the last piece of this. You're talking about tr maybe transitioning to go to gearless production model and not being the gear company, being the company that procures equipment. Um, what the, the number one skill set that requires is being an extraordinarily good buyer. You have to be really good at buying. You need people who are experts at buying, finding people, finding companies that can do the things you, that you do, negotiating a fair price for it, and getting the work done, keeping consistency up. Um, it's a very, and very important function, right? So to shift to that model where you know, you're the gearless model, you're the production management company is generally the model we call this production management you've got to be really good at production management. And half of that is procurement. Half of that is buying, being a really smart buyer. So yeah, you can do that, um, but that's a buying mechanism that a lot of companies don't have. Um, it's, a big, it's a big thing for them to change into. It is an important investment. Um, there's also things that they don't need to do anymore that they have to learn how to get out of. The, the big danger in all of that and feel free to reach out to me and I can talk to you about this in more depth, is not undoing the asset-based part of your business. So going halfway is really dangerous and causes a lot of problems. So either you're in the gear business or you're not in the gear business. There's not a middle of the road model. It's one or the other. And you can be an, an outsourcing company that happens to own some gear and you can be a gear company that happens to outsource but you can't be a company that sometimes outsources and sometimes owns gear, right? And there's, there's some distinctions in there you need to consider. So again, and if you're gonna do that, look at your goal. When do you expect to be fully functional? When do you expect to actually be able to deliver on that sale? And then back time when you have to make the first sale and back time to when you have to make the first contact because you're also selling to a different customer. So there's a lot of moving parts then. It's a new business plan, it's a new direction. Um, the, the better you are at planning, the more efficient you are gonna be in making that transition. Because again, if you projectize it like I've talked about today, you'll have a better chance of achieving success in a reasonable amount of time and um, not, messing your, not messing up in the process. So thank you for that, good question. Um, Oh, okay. Well, here, this. whenever I mention CRM, this is the question I always get, and I will go ahead and, and answer it again because it's important. If it wasn't important, people wouldn't ask all the time. Uh, we have a CRM in place. We institute it for a lot of the same reasons that you just described. However, we are having trouble getting salespeople to comply. Um, one salesperson in particular is one of our most successful. He's been around a long time, and he really doesn't think he needs, needs to do his job. Um, any suggestions? <laughs> yeah. I, yeah, I'm sorry. Um, I love salespeople. I hate salespeople. So CRM, what we, had, what we all need to understand is management is that the reason most of us don't get CRM implemented is because we think the CRM is for the salespeople and it's not. Um, even the CRM companies will tell you that it's really hard to make a value proposition on why this is better for salespeople. It is more work for them. Admit it. Be honest about that. The value of CRM is for all the other people in the business that are dependent on information that's in there. So the value of CRM is one for management to have oversight. You know, so what I tell salespeople is you want me to not be in your business every single day, put the crap in the CRM so I don't have to ask you about it. That's how to get me out of your hair. 
see that guy over there who's getting your show prepped or pulling your order? Okay. He needs what you have in the CRM to make sure that he has the people he needs to get your order out on time. Okay. Lots of people, they need that information. You know, remember when I told you you couldn't travel because we didn't have cash and I, I wouldn't let you use the credit card? Okay. Cash flow. Cash flow. The CRM tells me what my cash demands are. You surprised us last year by having a huge job with no down payment. We had tremendous out-of-pocket expenses. CRM would help us plan for that. So you have to make the case for CRM in the right tone, but do admit that, yeah, it, it's going to suck for you for a little bit until you get used to it. But once they get used to it, they'll find it's a great tool. And I, and I just really, in this day and age, with everything being software and software as a service and everything's on the cloud, I don't know how anybody would even try and function without working inside of some sort of CM, CRM program in a professional sales organization. So uh, thank you for that question. And all right. Uh, I got to paraphrase this one. All right, so the gist of the one that I'm looking at now, and I don't know how you had time to write this, <laughs> but is, uh, so basically what they're saying is that they do something similar to the quarterly management assessment that I talked about. I'll go back to that slide. The problem is they do the assessment and nothing happens. They don't make any changes. And it's, um, what can we do to stop that? Well, Typically, when, when nothing happens like this, it's, it's a problem that starts at the top. Um, you know, there's a tendency, you know, there's, you know, accountability is not everybody's long suit, right? We're not all good at holding people accountable and responsible to their jobs and reviewing things and not acting on them, you know, measuring things that doesn't cause you to change your behavior. You know, that's demoralizing. <laughs> so um, what you can do if you do the if you start approaching business the way I was talking about today is is treat it as a project with timelines and triggers. When you go through this and you don't have the results that you need, have the con have an honest conversation about how it moves the trigger, how that's going to affect timing. And for sometimes as leaders in your organizations and managers in your organization, you know, you the operations manager may have to lean forward and say, guys, Based on what you've just described to me, we're not going to get a warehouse this year. So I'm going to tell the team that we need to keep doing this and we're going to work on these things. But it's off the table because based on this, we don't have the, the, the traction or the timing to make that happen. And as management, you guys have to say, here, here's the implication of the information that we just assessed. Um, help the, uh, the accountability disinclined. <laughs> to make accountable nods, help them nod at the right time to allow the accountability to happen. Now this, I'm a big, I'm a big proponent of transparency in organizations. Um, um, the more, the more that people know, the more they can help. If you're concerned that you have people who will use the information in, uh, inappropriately, uh, um, get better people um, would be my, my millennial voice answer. Uh, get some better people. Um, I use transparency sometimes to find out who are the people who are not dependable with that information. Um, it's uh, give them enough rope to hang themselves. Um, if you need better people, get better people. You owe it to the good people that are in your organization. So um, I'm going to do one last question, and it's a super easy one. What CRM system do you recommend for a small business? My answer is yes. <laughs> That's a how long is a piece of string question. Um, now, knowing the person who asked this question, the size of their organization, I would, I would definitely be looking at very simple CRM tools. Um, you're probably not going to migrate over to a Salesforce or a HubSpot, you know, if you've got two or three salespeople. Um, it's, it's probably not worth the investment. And the fact that you can get the transparency you want off a, off a much simpler uh, project management system, heck, even a well-executed spreadsheet or Outlook will allow you to do a lot of CRM type things. A lot of the software you use to run your company, including QuickBooks, have some basic CRM built in. Um, it may not do all the things that you want to do, but you can do a lot of them. Um, I, I actually use, I use a, a, a project management software called monday.com, um, which is 
you know, designed for people who aren't very clever and uh, which is, means it's very effective for me because it was a very slow, easy learning curve. Um, but if you just Google CRM software for small companies, do a few of the demos, you're looking for software that has the personality that fits into your organization. Think about what it needs to talk to or interface with. Think about the reports you want to get out of it, the information you want to have. How quickly and easily can you get it? Uh, make those assessments, and you don't have to spend a ton of money. Um, I, I spend, you know, I've got a team of four people on my CRM. I spend 500 bucks a year on it. Um, other CRMs, you can spend $500 a seat. You can spend $500 a month. So shop around a little bit. Um, do the free demos. Try it out for a couple of weeks or a couple of months, whatever their demo period is. Um, and, and learn from it and then take that and look at, use that to evaluate the next one. So thanks for asking all of that. All right. Um, well, that's it. I think, um, we're, Hey, we're out of time. Thanks for being with me today. I hope you guys got something out of it. Um, shoot me an email if you got any more questions and, uh, be sure and register for next month's webinar. That registration is already up at trstipson.com slash webinars. And you'll see the recording for this will come to you tomorrow. Um, uh, probably about 25 hours from now, if the recording came out well, which it usually does. And uh, that's it. Thank you guys very, very much. Have a great, exciting 2020. We'll see you soon.